Hi, and welcome back to the channel of Biblical Theology, Exegesis, and Hermeneutics, where meaning is always context-driven. Um, today we're going to be looking at Psalm 2 um, to complete the introduction to the Psalter, um, and also noting um, the Hebrew poetry, and we'll be following that uh, today. Um, and so here in this particular slide, it's just this is just the the opening rhetorical question of the psalm: Lama ragashu goyim uleumim yehgu rik. Um, so this this is just says why do the nations rage, and the peoples or or the countries imagine a vain thing? Um, so that that's how it opens up. And um, and so the the presuppositions behind this the, these rhetorical questions is obviously that there is some type of uh, of rebellion going on, and, and and as the psalm goes on, we'll see that the nations are in rebellion against Yahweh, um, and they have been uh, continually, um, but more so as this psalm um, when it reaches its fulfillment. Um, theologically, um, that would only happen during the millennium um, of uh, at Christ's return. Um, so this this, this is uh, definitely a, a, a completely different uh, ten, uh, ten, tenor from from the previous Psalm, Psalm one. That particular Psalm. Um, introduces the reader to have a particular type of attitude when approaching the Psalms uh, uh, in, in terms of morality that one needs to be pious because it was it would it 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 approached um, uh, the world as the, that there is the the righteous and the wicked um, and it, and so in this psalm here it's not looking at that type of uh, of a uh, uh, vision um, uh, of a Torah psalm. This one is is political and theological and eschatological um, and messianic in in its reach. Um, so Psalm one was basically talking to us how how we need to concern ourselves with daily living. This particular psalm envisions for us historically. Um, for the future where the world's history is destined to go. And, um, and, and we can see here by the opening salvo of questions that the world wants to uh, rule itself and have its own dominion um, over the nations. Um, but God, in his sovereignty, is going to guide uh, the world's history. And it's going to end in a climax of um, the Davidic king ruling over all the earth. And that will take place at the millennium. So this will all, you know, looking at the book of Revelation, this is how it it's going to um, end in like Revelation 19. And then he sets up a millennial kingdom for a thousand years. And, and 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 this concerns uh, basically it'll, this will all take place within Revelation chapter twenty, theologically. Okay, so that's kind of how uh, uh, they're very different, but but they both both of these Psalms one and two introduce you to the the Psalter, um, and you need to have both both uh, um, particular points of view when entering it, um, and that we need to know uh, where history is going. What, what, where is the, what, what does the Bible say where the future is going to lead us? And so, the, and this is one of these uh, major points of the Old Testament that tells us that it's going to end with the Davidic rule uh, of Christ um, over the entire earth. Um, so that 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 let that be um, our introduction to um, this particular psalm. 
Okay, um, and then coming to this, this is a what we call as royal psalms, and there are a number of them here in in within the the, the psalter, and um, uh, and I believe this particular schis, schismatic here is taken from uh, C. Hassel Bullock, um, and uh, I use this when I uh, when I used his book as a uh, as a textbook for the class. Um, but the royal psalms concern uh, the Davidic king and anointed ruler, and, and, and sometimes they do mention uh, David um, as the ideal ruler. Um, and, and so by the way, this is important for us to see that there are a number of different royal psalms. Okay, and then coming to the actual text itself, um, what I did here is, is th this, if, if we look here at uh, Psalm uh, uh, 2, verses 1 through 3, the focus here is going to be on the rebellion of the kings of the earth. That's the focus. Um, and and we'll, we'll see this. Why do the nations rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand together, and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed. And then it ends with, with this die stick here uh, uh, of a quotation of their own speech. Let us tear apart their bonds, and let us cast away their cords from us. And then look at verse 4. The one who sits in the heavens laughs. Okay, so right away you can see here um, that there's going to be a transition at verse 4. So verses 1 through 3 focus on an overall topic. And it's important that when we read Scripture, it's, it, it, you, you want to digest things and, and summarize things and itemize uh, the text as you go along to understand it correctly. Because uh, remember, meaning is always context-driven. And so th the, the texts naturally have a group of thoughts that create a, um, a heading. Um, and, and, and so verses 1 through 3 would be our, in speaking in, in terms of, uh, of poetic speak, um, this would be the first strophe. So there's a strophe of verses 1 through 3. And then the next strophe is going to be verses 4 through 6. And the focus of this is Yahweh's reaction to the nation's rebellion. And so we'll see the logic of this. Um, the one who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord mocks at them. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his burning anger. Uh, but I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And that makes one, that makes the next strophe. And these are really, I, they, 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 you, you just follow the speech patterns and who's speaking and, and who's the subject. And, 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 and this, is, this helps you break down a text into its various component parts. If you look at verse 7 now, it's, it's talking about the Davidic king um, and, and, and his reaction to his coronation. Now let's look at verse 7 through 9. I, report, I will report Yahweh's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possessions for your possession and you will shatter them with a rod of iron and you will dash them in pieces like a uh, potter's vessel um, that's a nicely it's it's all conceptually understood as as the as the davidic monarch's uh, reaction to yahweh's coronation of him um that is spoken of there in verse 6. So 7 to 9 form a perfect uh, um, third strophe. And then look at verses 10 through 12. And now, O kings, act wisely. 
Be warned, O judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way. For his wrath burns uh, momentarily, um, or, or his wrath is incited easily. Uh, blessed are the, all those who take refuge in him. So this is obviously now the, the narrator's um, instructions for the kings of the earth for how they are to be, um, how they should behave themselves um, after Yahweh has uh, installed his anointed king on Mount Zion. So this is the fourth strophe. So this nicely breaks down into uh, four strophes. Uh, very, very, uh, there's no question, I think, if you, if you begin to look at, at, at any commentary, it's all, everyone's going to break this thing down in a macro structure of, of these four different strophes. Um, and you can see this here, how um, I, I just put this together. Uh, at looking at a macro structure, Psalm 2, Yahweh's coronation of the Davidic king and the nation's rebellion. And then, so you have a report of the rebellions of the kings of the earth, 1 through 3, report of Yahweh's reaction to the kings' rebellion, 4 through 6, the report of the Davidic king's reaction to his coronation, 7 to 9, and lastly, the psalmist's instructions for the kings to submit to the Davidic king, 10 to 12. So that's, that's, it's, it's, it, and, all, and scholars also look at this as like an A, B, B, um, A construction. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so there's, uh, but most scholars look at it this way. Um, so I've just, I've given this here some, uh, this is just my uh, particular um, analysis of this at the moment. Um, but it's important at least to, to break it down into sections. Um, and then that way when we, when we go over each section, we can look at the micro uh, structure uh, of each particular unit. And we'll do that now. Okay, so coming to, um, uh, to the first strophe, the report of the rebellion of the kings of the earth, verses 1 through 3. So this is going to break down into three separate sections. Um, and let's look at this. The, the first one is the rhetorical questions concerning the nations. Why do the nations rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? So that's the, that's the opening salvo, and that would be point A. Um, and, and remember here that uh, we, we need to be looking at the relationship of line A to line B in, in this biblical parallelism um, of here, which uh, this particular, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of, of synonymous parallelism with, within this particular psalm. And, um, and line A and line B um, are, are, are set um, in, in, in lines, and we need to discern what is going on here. And it's set up chiastically um, here. Uh, you need to see that, that you first have in, 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 in uh, the first half of the verse, in the first um, verse set, why uh, do the nations rage? So in Hebrew, you're going to have ragishu goyim, and then in the second verse set, um, it's going to, it's going to be reversed, um, and it's ula umim yehgu rik, and the peoples imagine a vain thing, um, and so that's chiastically set off. So it's it's it, he the, 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 this is looking at um, our art history, and. Um, and, and the difference here between nations and leumim, peoples or countries, um, I don't really think that there's supposed to be here a big... Uh, when I read this, I'm not looking at this as line A is introductory, line B is, 
is where all the theological cash is. I think the way the relationship of or the correspondence of, of the first verse set of line A to line B are more evenly matched um, and that they both are uh, they both are, are very pungent. Um, and first of all, they're, 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 they're raging and, um, and, and their rage here is set on that they're, it's actually, um, Haga is the, is, is, we, was used in the, in the first Psalm that we should meditate in the law day and night here. The, why are the nations meditating on a vain thing? Um, but we don't translate it that way. Um, although you could, I mean, if you're reading Hebrew, you're going to pick up on the, this correspondence here. Um, but we are going to uh, contemplate would be a good a good way to to translate this, and the peoples would contemplate a vain thing. So the the nations are raging and they're contemplating. Uh, something vain um, and and we don't know exactly what that is these two lines are setting us up and you need to read it off of it it's going to be explained to us in in the following die sticks that are to come so so really this isn't like you know don't look at this as kugel what's line a line b is more this 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 die stick is basically functioning as line A. Verse two is going to be, and, and line, you know, and, and verses two and three are going to be setting us up for what their rage and their vain imagining is all about. So, so here, um, when we look at the correspondence and the relationship of line A to line B. Um, you're looking at this and you're going, nah, it doesn't really seem this should be in, you know, this, this, this is functioning as, as, uh, an introductory clause and, and then all the cash is going to be in, in the people's imagine a vain thing. No, it's verse two and verse three is where the theological cash is, is going to be, is going to be found. So it's the relationship, not within the die stick, but between the die sticks here. So let's go to verse two. And the kings of the earth have taken their stand. And the rulers have taken counsel together. Okay, so now, now there it, it's 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 coming a little bit closer. It's marching uh, towards where they're going. And um, let's uh, and let's look at where this ultimately goes against Yahweh and against His anointed. So there you go. So. So these these three die sticks here um, are all set in relationship to one another. So this is we should read these three die sticks kind of like you would read it as a as a uh, as a um, a tricolon. And uh, and, we're, and what I'm saying by that is that that the first die stick is setting you up. The second one is it, it, it's getting thicker, and then all the theological cash now is going to be found in the second half of verse two, against Yahweh and against His anointed. So there you go. There is, uh, and that would be Messiah against His Messiah, His anointed one. Um, so the relationship is both within lines and between lines. Um, as the bishop told us, um, and um, so so we got we got to remember that um, it's always not just within you know line A to line B, but it's within uh, it's it's in 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 lines in between lines, um, and, and that's important here then to understand how to read this because you may be looking at this and 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 how um, we've been instructed especially through altar. And um, and Google, um, and and remember that if we go back to the bishop, he told us it's the correspondence within lines and between lines, as well as Norman Gottwald told us that. Um, so let's uh, that, that's a little correction here to 
understand this. Uh, but the point is still there. Uh, these are structures of intensification. It's just not within the die stick. It's between them. Um, and, and ultimately, then, verse 3 um, is, is now their own reported speech. Um, and what, the, what does it say? It says, let us tear apart um, their bonds and let us cast away from us um, uh, their cords. Um, so anyhow, um, you can see this even in the book of Revelation chapter 6. It, you know, they're, they're trying to hide from the wrath of, uh, of, of God. And, um, and, uh, and here, they, this, is, this is what they do not want Yahweh's law to be reigning over them. When you're looking at his, the bonds and the cords, this is, when we, when we look at the book of Revelation, what it's about, it's about how God is culminating world history and how they're in ultimately in rebellion against God and they're going to actually, the battle of Armageddon is a war against uh, Yahweh coming from heaven. That's what it's all about. Um, you need to you need to understand this 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 here this particular uh, y y when we read the book of Revelation you you got to go back to the Old Testament and you have all these different uh, works that you need to then uh, understand and how to understand uh, Revelation nineteen that saw that this Psalm is going to be one of the uh, um, one of the texts that 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 you would want to have in your mind to understand what is going on in uh because this is establishing the um millennial reign and because this has not happened uh this has never happened um in, in in history um and but it will be it will be fulfilled during the millennium um and so it's important that here we want to look at the correspondence between the lines. And so these, uh, these four die sticks here, um, this whole quatrain of, 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 um, of dice, uh, of, of lines here is very, very important that, that we read them all together. Um, and, and it's developing for us uh, a picture. Um, and this is the report of the rebellion of the kings of the earth. So let's see what happens next. Okay, so when we come to um, the second strophe, this is uh, the report of Yahweh's reaction to the kings' rebellion. So let's look at this. It says, uh, the one who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord mocks at them. Then he will speak to them in his wrath, and he will terrify them in his burning anger. Um, but I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Okay, so th this is going to be then the, sec the second strophe. Look at, uh, this is important because this is also going to have some, uh, uh, you may want to look at this as a, as a correspondence between Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Um we already saw how the word uh, haga was used uh, to meditate day and night versus they, they, they are contemplating the vain thing from Psalm 2 verse 1. So here the correspondence is, remember it said the worst place to be was to be a scoffer. Um, and, and, and that was... Uh, uh, but he did, did, but does, he did not take his seat... Uh, or he did not sit in the seat of the scoffers. And so, but here we have Yahweh seated in the heavens, scoffing at, at the, their rebellion. So um, it's fine for Yahweh to scoff and laugh um, because he's, he's mocking and laughing at how these rebellious people on earth the kings have taken their stand against him and against his his anointed one and so it's it, it's a vain thing to uh try to fight god you're never going to win god is not mocked 
and um, and here the psalmist definitely says uh, Yahweh is laughing at them and mocking them. Um, you know, uh, you may not like that in your particular taste of God, um, but you you're not living here in in the. Uh, Wait till you get into the millennium or, or to, into the tribulation um, um, that Revelation talks about, and and uh, when the Antichrist sets up his kingdom, then you're going to appreciate God's laughter and God's mocking, um, because that will become a comfort to to you. All right, so he he's sitting in the heavens and he's laughing and he's mocking at them. Um, and, and then from that position, he will speak to them in his anger and, and he will terrify them in, in his burning anger. Um, that's verse 5 here. And uh, so th this here definitely goes to, back to um, Revelation chapter 6. That they're, remember, they're hiding and they're asking the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them, to hide them from from God's wrath um, and, uh, and and that's important to see here that uh, um, God does get angry um, and and he does uh, and he does he does terrify people um, you, you I'm sure that uh, um, we've all had dreams where, uh, God is uh, gently, or, or he's getting our attention, let's put it that way. Um, and God knows how to get the attention of people. Um, and uh, you don't really want to get God ticked off at you. Um, and, and God can get pissed off. Um, just, you know, don't, don't push it. Don't, don't, push, don't push your luck against them. Uh, you don't mock God. Um, definitely remember you got to understand the context of this. When the nations unite in council and they take their stand, and it's specifically against Yahweh and against his anointed, then, they, they, then you got to remember, the, the, they're setting up themselves uh, in, a, in a united front, fighting God. So, uh, so what do you expect God to do? So he uh, he can't allow them to 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 run the, the the world. He can't allow injustice to conquer and win the day. He has to intervene. So this is you know. And so how does he do it? Look at verse six. Okay, how, how is he going to defeat them? I have installed. Literally, I have poured out my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Um. And so scholars, no one translates this poured out, but it is literally what it is. It's, it's, it's like to pour out a libation or, you know, pour out the anointing oil. If you go back to, um, the, you know, what was it, verse 3, that they're united against Yahweh and against his, what, Mashiach, okay, against his anointed one. How do you get anointed when oil is poured over you? Um, upon you that that was part of the coronation process of uh, of a king's coronation um, and so this may be picking up on on uh, that uh, connotation um, but we translate nasak here as um, I have installed but you should allow that meaning though to maybe go back and be attached to the 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 word uh, anointed one um, from verse three. Okay, so um, so so the the nations were raging; they're in rebellion, and then this is how God's uh, his reaction is is one of laugh, laughter, and mocking, and that is an intensifying uh, line. That's introductory. Mocking is is the worst. God's going to mock them. Um, and he speaks to them in his anger, and he terrifies them in his burning anger. That's um, that's another structure of intensification. Um, and then I have uh, um, 
appointed or installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. So that's telling. And this is a this verse six de- departs from uh, from I guess from synonymous parallelism, and this is uh, um, just one of those particular types that the bishop referred to as synthetic. Um, and it just it, this is just completing a thought. Um, and it's and, and, and we need to look at this. It is important that he's not just installing his king anywhere. It's a it's where it's at Zion. And uh, and then what is Zion? It's God's holy hill. So that's it's very specific there. Um, and and that's important to note. So these are all structures of intensification. Um, just this is this this psalm is just represents excellent poetry. Okay, so um, now coming here to uh, the third strophe, the report of the Davidic king's reaction to his coronation. Um, so let's look at this. Uh, I will report Yahweh's decree. He said to me, "You are my son. Today I have begotten you." Ask of me, and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. You will shatter them with a rod of iron, and you will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Okay, so this is really, this third strophe is going to be at the heart of where we see this psalm taking us, that this is a universal dominion of of the uh, 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 of the Davidic monarch. So this is why we would apply this to this as a messianic royal psalm. Um, and that obviously this has never been uh, uh, fulfilled. And, and so the, the only way this could can be fulfilled is uh, as we would see at Christ's second return, uh, at his second coming, when he sets up a millennial reign and and, and 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 these are promises actually to the, the the seven churches whereas one of them is is that you know he, you know if you to the one who overcomes I'll grant him to you know uh, rule with a rod of iron um, so uh, and so they're joining in with Christ in his millennial reign they become kings and priests um, so this here is uh, Definitely, you have to. This is why why you have to read this psalm uh, messianically, ultimately, and uh, and and the only way it fits in the New Testament is is in the millennial reign. Okay, so um, so let's look at this. This is talking about um, so so Christ. It's his going to be his reaction to um, his coronation um, to set up the millennial kingdom that God has granted him. And so God says here, um, or it, it just says, the, I mean, excuse me, the, the Davidic monarch Christ, said, he's, he's saying here that I will report or I will tell of Yahweh's decree. Um, he said to me, and so now this is what he's saying, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And then um, this is as if Yahweh says, ask of me, and what will Yahweh do? I will give to you um, the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. And how are you going to do that? You will shatter them with a rod of iron, and you will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So these are for those who refuse to submit to the king, they will ultimately be destroyed. Um, you can also look at Zechariah chapter 14, um, where where this will also be taking place during the millennium. Um, there's, you know, people, there's still going to be people on the earth. Um, God doesn't kill everybody at his second coming, just those, just the, the armies that are gathered at Armageddon, he kills. Um and there's going to be a lot of people left that we are going to rule and reign over. And these people are going to be living as humans and we will have a glorified body ruling over them. And we will share in Christ's rule. 
Um, I'm just looking at this. This is more of a biblical theology of this particular psalm, obviously, how I've been interpreting this. That's incorporating both testaments. Um, and uh, so, excuse me for, um, for me doing that, but, uh, but that's how I wanted to approach uh, today's, uh, uh, I guess, exegesis of this uh, from a... Uh, um, from a both Old and New Testament perspective. Um, so ultimately here, um, God is going to rule over the earth through the Messiah. Um, and it's and it, 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 it's specifically a worldwide dominion. Um, and we have this adoption formula, today I have begotten you. Um, you are my son, today I have begotten you, verse 7. Um now we need to know that, w that this adoption language. Where does it come from? It it comes from Second Samuel um, chapter seven, verse fourteen, and, and this is the prophetic oracle that God gave to Nathan to give to David, um, and he says that um, here, uh, and this is Nathan talking to David. And he says, uh, when your days are fulfilled and you lay down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed after you, who shall go forth from your bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. That's verse 12, verse 13. And he will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And when he commits iniquity, I will reprove him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of man. So we can see here that this promise uh, uh, from Nathan uh, um, to David here um, is that God is going to set up a the house of David uh, forever and that the kings were looked at as sons and they were considered the and God was uh, considered to be their father uh, that's second Samuel 7 14 and I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son so um, and then with this part here where when he commits iniquity and I will reprove him so this is you know you can go to Hebrews for that that you know we're all sons of God and uh, and, and there is no son that he receives that it is, is, isn't, uh, isn't disciplined. And if you're not disciplined, well, you're, you're uh, basically a bastard. So um, every, every son that God receives, he disciplines. Um, and, uh, and so uh, God knows how to spank his children. Um, but here, um, Christ will never, that, will, that, that doesn't happen to Christ because he's, Remember, he, he was the God man, and um, and and ultimately, um, he he has he doesn't commit iniquity, and he doesn't he isn't chastised by God. Um, so you can see how Second Samuel seven fourteen this adoption language um, is given to the kings of uh, of uh, of Judea, um, and then we apply this same terminology here um, to Christ. Um, and so when you think of uh, the Son of God here, you need to be thinking that this language ultimately goes back to kingship language. Um, and, you know, today I've begotten you is that, well, today I have installed you, um, or you, this is your coronation, this is the day that you were you know, uh, being crowned as king. So the, the begottenness is that of uh, uh, beginning to, that God installs his king, and, um, and then the relationship between God and the king is one of a father and a son. And so this is established for us in Second Samuel, and this is where this tradition goes back to. And so when you read the... the um, 
you know, the New, the New Testament, especially the Gospels, this is where that whole idea comes from about the Son of God. Um, and, and this is uh, how you should understand it. Um, and then ultimately, here we come to verse 9, that um, God gives him a promise of military defeat uh, of, of the nations, and then there's this simile that he will dash them like a potter's vessel. So this is uh, ultimately Christ is to rule the world. If there's any opposition, uh, they will be dashed in pieces. Okay, so coming here to the end of the psalm, um, now we have the psalmist's instructions to the kings and judges of the earth in verses 10 to 12. Um, and we have this nice little transitional formula, and now. So this is basically, you know, how, how the psalmist is, is going to end uh, and transition into this last strophe, this final fourth strophe. Um, and, and that's important that you, take, pay, you pay attention to vi'ata uh, in verse 10. That's how it opens up in Hebrew, vi'ata. And now, okay, and so then you're, okay, so then what's coming next? It sa so it says um, here, and now, O kings, act wisely. Be warned, O judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear. Uh, rejoice with trembling, kiss the son lest he be angry, and you perish from the way. For his wrath burns easily. Uh, that'd probably be a better translation here for ki yiv er. Um, and then it ends here with um, ashre kol uh, jose bo. Um, um, Blessed are, are, are how fortunate are all those who take refuge in him. Um, so this here has some other language. Two, two different things here. Um, the very last uh, verset, blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Um, remember, Psalm 1 began with Ashrei ash ha'ish asher, right? Blessed is the man who... Um, now this this is forms like an inclusio to that so psalm 1 and 2 are taken together as 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 an introduction to the whole psalter and it, and it has this envelope structure where it begins and ends with ashray um and if you look at verse 12 it says and you perish in the way uh remember we had uh you know but the way of the wicked shall perish right so this is an echo of that and it says uh vitovedu direct and 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 they perish in the way um so so this psalm psalm one and two have a lot of different uh um connections between them too with with phraseology um and when you look at them as um introductory to the psalter then you can you see further little um way they that they, they have correspondences between them um but now what what is this fourth fourth uh strophe all about it's about um instructions for submission to the davidic monarch he, he's giving them uh um advice and so looking at verse 10 uh this is uh mental preparation so it's it he's so how you do that he's telling them to act o kings act wisely and be warned o judges of the earth so this is he's he's warning them um that they just can't be acting uh as they as you know as they want to they have to be submitted to the davidic monarch um, and if they don't, they're, they're going to be destroyed. You're not going to be able to play games in the millennium. Um, and, and this is what this is ultimately, we need to look at it. This is future. Um, and, and this is, uh, you know, we only have one chapter in the New Testament, you know, about the millennium there in Revelation 20. But there's, you know, you have to fill it in with the Old Testament. And there's tons of material to throw in there. And this is definitely one of them. Uh, so 
So it's, you know, especially Zechariah 14, you want to put in there. I mean, look at Isaiah, the, the end of the book there. There'll be a lot there to put in there. Um, so so this is the the mental preparation is talking it's found in verse 10 physical policy that he is giving to the kings and the judges is that they should serve Yahweh with fear rejoice with trembling so he you know they, they he's in telling them that you need to have fear i mean christians really don't like this but you know what i don't really you know, you need to you need to read your Bible. It's in the Gospels. It says, "Don't fear the guy who can kill your body but can't do nothing to your soul." Jesus says, "Rather fear the one who can destroy your body and throw your soul into hell." That's who you ought to fear. Um, and uh, so, specifically, you know, all this foolish talk about this candy cotton God that people create for themselves in the new testament it's a bunch of garbage um you need to be you you need to fear god um and it's all over the new testament you just need to open your eyes and uh because god's wrath is god's wrath is uh, easily kindled i mean just go to romans the wrath of god is being revealed from heaven not was not shall be it is being um so um, people need to wake up and smell the coffee. Um, and don't create for yourselves a phony God, um, one after your own image. Um, you, you need you need to have a biblical theology. Um, make your theology built upon what the Scripture says, not some person's uh, vain imagination of who God is. God's a lot bigger than you. Um, so here, I don't know why I went there, but I did. Um, maybe you need to hear that. Um, so looking here at this physical policy, you need to serve God with fear and rejoice with trembling. Um, and that's for the kings of the earth, to, for them to remember that they just can't be doing their own thing. They can't be making their own policies. Remember, they, all, God is reigning and ruling from Jerusalem. And, and you have to align your policy with the policy that is established at Mount Zion. Remember, the law will go forth from, uh, from Mount Zion. Um, remember, that's the whole thing there going on in, uh, in Micah and in, in Isaiah chapter 2. Um, that's another thing where we need to put in here uh, about the millennial reign where they, you know, beat their swords into plowshares. Um, so here's instructions for the kings. Um, and then there's a, a, a final instruction and purpose of instruction, which is kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. That's that's important. So so kissing the king is that that you are a vassal. This is looking as a vassal and suzerain relationship of the ancient world, um, where the other kings of the earth they're underneath the vassalship of the uh, hegemonic king, which would be the Davidic king here ruling from Zion, um, and then they are to implement Yahweh's law and rule. Uh, in their own domains, um, under their own peoples. Um, and so this is, uh, so he says, kiss the son. So th they have to have an act of submission and that they have to come before the king to um, uh, give their allegiance. Um, and and if they, and he's reminding them that, that Yahweh's, uh, you know, uh, the Davidic king's wrath can be kindled very easily. So don't get out of line. Um, and then it, it ends, uh, in this basis clause for his wrath is kindled easily. Uh, blessed are all those who take refuge in him. And so he's telling them that it'll be well with you if you submit and go along with the program and you'll be blessed. 
and the millennial reign will go along as it's as it should but if you rebel against what the davidic monarch wants you will perish um, tovid do derek here in verse 12 they'll perish in the way okay um this is uh the end of uh looking at these particular two psalms as the introductory to um the whole psalter uh, i hope this has been a blessing